Hello, and welcome to this Secret Life of Badgers virtual event. Uh, we're so glad to have you join us today. My name is Mike Kahn. I'm a public affairs specialist at MidPen Open Space. Kareem Tukatlian, a biologist at MidPen, will be joining me shortly to give today's presentation. We have been uh, taking some events online uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic. Our thoughts are with all of those affected and by the virus, affected by the virus, excuse me, and I hope that you and your loved ones are all safe. And as many of you have heard, may have heard through the news or on our website, there are wildfires burning in the Santa Cruz Mountains, but not currently in our preserves. Our thoughts are with all of those impacted by the fires, including staff who have been evacuated from their homes and to our rangers and field staff for their tireless efforts to ensure public safety and for all the first responders who are involved. Wildland fire prevention, preparation, and response are important, an important part of our work, and you will be hearing more about these efforts in the future. And as people continue to sign on, I wanna take a few minutes to give you some instructions on how to participate today and to provide an, a brief overview of MidPen. To kick things off, uh, we'd love to know where you are watching from today. You can submit your answer now, and you may be wondering how to do that. Uh, if you are joining us on our website, you will see a comments and questions submission box below the video. And on Facebook and YouTube streams, you can post your comments and questions right on the page. So look forward to seeing those come in. All right, see some now. Um, we'll, we'll be able to answer some questions at the end of the presentation, but you can submit them at any time. Okay, let's see where people are coming from. We did see registration from all over the Bay Area and internationally, got uh, San Jose, Portland, Oregon, awesome, Marin, Sacramento, Liverpool, UK. Wow. Uh, this is great. Um, yeah, just keep them coming. And uh, thanks for all the, the participation. Los Gatos, excellent. Um, great to see everybody on here. Um, so welcome to all. And I want to give you a quick orientation to MidPen and our mission. And we are, we are a public agency, special district located south of San Francisco in the small inset upper right map. You can see San Francisco at the top of the peninsula. And you can see our district um, outlining it, my cursor in, in green. Uh, that's our district boundaries. Um, we are located on the peninsula and on the west side of Silicon Valley area. And we extend out to the coast in San Mateo County by the Pacific Ocean. Most of our preserves are located along the spine of the Santa Cruz Mountains. And you can see our preserves in, in dark green. And within our boundaries, we have protected over 65,000 acres of open space in our mission to create a permanently protected regional green belt that is important for habitat connectivity and species survival, including badgers, as we will learn today. MidPen works to restore and maintain the natural environment to benefit the plants and wildlife. And sorry, I still have some pop-ups. Pop <laughs> and so for plants and wildlife and the clean air and water they provide us. We also manage over 240 miles of free public access trails for hiking, and many trails also offer mountain biking and horseback riding. 
On the coast side, we also work to sustain local small-scale agriculture and conservation grazing that helps to maintain grassland habitats. And now speaking of grasslands, uh, I will now, uh, this is very important habitat to the badgers, and I will now turn things over to Corrine Tocatlian for the main presentation to tell us all about these secretive animals. I will rejoin you at the end of the, um, end for some Q&A. And uh, without further ado, further ado, take it away, Corrine. Great, thank you, Mike, for that introduction. And welcome all of you to our virtual talk. Like Mike said, um, I'm Corrine Tocatlian. I'm a wildlife biologist with MidPen. And I also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the challenges that many of you might be experiencing right now, not only related to COVID, but now as wildfires are actively displacing so many of our friends and family and colleagues in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Many of our own MidPen staff have been responding to fires and evacuating their homes. So I want to thank everyone who is working to keep us safe, and I truly hope you are able to stay safe and healthy. I'm grateful for your time today and your interest in the secret life of badgers. I'm going to start by sharing some badger biology with you, and I'll also touch on uh, burrowing owls as well. And then I'm going to discuss a really exciting study that we are actively working on and some ways that you or your organization might be able to participate if you're interested. Today, I'll be representing a lot of the great work that our study team has been doing, which we're all very excited about. So let's get started. First, I want us all to take a moment to imagine ourselves on a beautiful trail walking through open grassland habitat, perhaps at Midpen's Russian Ridge or Windy Hill Preserves, and think about if you've ever seen a large mound of dirt or a large mound of soil on the landscape and thought, what on earth happened there? Or if you've come across several dugout holes clustered together and thought and wonder to yourself, what kind of animal might have left that sign? You might be surprised to learn that badgers could be sharing your favorite trails and grasslands in the San Francisco Peninsula. And when you see these signs, you might be coming upon a site where a badger has rested or eaten its latest meal. Several species of badger are found worldwide, and the area in red on the map shows the geographic range of the American badger that occurs here in North America. And even though these animals are wide ranging, American badgers are one of the least understood mammals in North America because of their nocturnal lifestyle, their underground lifestyle, and the lack of historical species data that's available to us because they're very difficult to see and find. So they're still somewhat of a mystery to us. The American badger is a member of the family Mustelidae, which also includes animals like ferret, otters, skunks, and weasels. And American badgers are short, stout animals that I sometimes jokingly call walking footstools because of their shape and their stature. They are very low to the ground. And their semi-fossorial lifestyle um, means that they spend a good portion of their lives underground, either sleeping or digging for their food or breeding. And one of their most prominent features are their large front feet with long curved front claws, which you can see in the photo here. And these front feet and claws basically act like shovels that are really essential for the extensive digging that they do. On average, American badger can be one and a half to three feet in length, and they can weigh anywhere between 10 to 30 pounds, depending on the sex and the age of that animal. American badgers have triangular faces that are dark in color, and they have an obvious white or what we call a medial stripe that runs between the eyes. And it starts at the nose and sort of moves back toward the back of the head and can even extend all the way down um, on their back and between their shoulders. Badgers have two black patches or what some people call badges on the sides of their face. The hair on their body ranges from gray to reddish brown in color and uh, it appears sort of shaggy or grizzled in appearance. And they have short stubby tails and large round ears that you can see in this photo here. 
Badger's vision is poor, but their senses of smell and hearing are really quite strong. And those senses help them detect their prey underground, and then they can dig those prey out and um, have their next meal. I've heard the name badger come from two different origins. The first is from those two black patches on the sides of their face. Again, some people call those badges. The other potential origin is from the French word bichure, meaning digger, which is also very appropriate because everything about a badger's body is designed for digging, which they are extremely skilled at. Badgers have been observed digging themselves out of sight in less than two minutes, even in very hard packed soil. And I really like this photo um, that Christine Fielding um, contributed to us of a badger digging at Ed Levin County Park in Santa Clara County. And it just shows how actively they can dig through these, these um, soils. Their heads are wedge shaped, which allows them to easily move through the burrows. And they're powered by these strong shoulders and broad chest and those large front paws. This photo shows how long those front claws can actually be, and their front feet are also partially webbed, which helps keep their toes together for even stronger digging capability. Their eyes are also protected from flying dirt as they're moving through soils very quickly, um, protected by an inner eyelid, uh, also called a nictitating membrane that drops down when it's needed. Badgers have thick but loose skin that enables them to sort of turn around in tight spaces. So that prevents them from getting stuck in some of these burrows. So everything about this animal has really evolved to make them excellent digging creatures. Badgers are very secretive and they usually avoid people. So they tend to reveal their secrets on wildlife cameras rather than in person. So now that we've covered the basics of badger appearance, let's take a look at a few photos and see if we can identify who we're looking at. Feel free to put your thoughts um, into whatever chat box you're working with or share with your neighbor. And there are several species here in the peninsula that could be mistaken for American badger if the angle or the light isn't quite right. So let's see how we do in this exercise. Here in this photo, we see an animal with a short tail and an overall uniform body pattern, features that are similar to American badgers. But the stature isn't quite right, and look at the length of that back foot. It's, it looks a bit long for a badger. Remember that badgers are short and stout, kind of like footstools. This photo is actually of a bobcat, and the stripes on the tail and the patches on the back of the ears are a dead giveaway. So if you guessed bobcat, congratulations, you are correct. Okay, let's try another. Um, you may see this animal more frequently in your neighborhoods. That's a little bit of a hint. The body is sort of short and stout, and the hair looks a little bit shaggy, like an American badger, but notice the length of the tail, and notice that it's also patterned or ringed. So remember, American badgers have short tails with no patterns. This photo is of a raccoon. You might be two for two at this point. This animal in this photo has a much shorter foot than the bobcat, a low, stout body, and overall shaggy appearance, shaggy hair appearance. The length of the tail doesn't seem too prominent, and we don't see any major patterns here on any part of the body. So we're checking a lot of boxes for American badgers so far. We can't quite see the head yet, but as it continues walking, now we can clearly see those short, stocky legs and that sort of footstool-shaped body. We can also see the black markings or badges on the side of that triangular shaped head. So congratulations, we have a badger. American badgers are carnivorous and they mostly eat small burrowing rodents like gophers or ground squirrels or voles, depending on what geographic region we're finding ourselves in. And they dig these animals out from under the ground again, using their strong, powerful front claws. Um, again, we see that Digging is a huge part of their ecology, and they also have strong jaws and sharp teeth to process or eat their animal prey. They are also opportunistic feeders, which means they will eat other prey that they come across, including anything from insects to birds, bird eggs, reptiles, amphibians, even wasp nests, and even some people have reported badgers eating and caching small cows, which is absolutely incredible to me. Um, badgers are mostly nocturnal and they do most of their hunting at night. The diet of 
California badger specifically is a little bit less understood. Again, we we know generally um, some specifics about the species, but in California, we're, a lot of things are still um, not quite well understood. But um, it's very likely that they follow these same general patterns here in California and on the peninsula. Badger digs are often associated with California ground squirrel colonies in the Diablo and Gavilan ranges. And in Monterey County, some researchers have found that that same association is found with pocket gophers and meadow voles. American badgers are widespread in North America and are most common in the western part of the continent. There are four subspecies of American badger that you can see um, illustrated in this map here. The, the subspecies are distinguished by differences in body hair color, size, and of course genetics. And two of these subspecies occur in California, the paler and the smaller southern subspecies, which we can see in green here, and the larger and darker Jeffersonii subspecies in the coastal and northern areas. In the Santa Cruz Mountains, we tend to talk a lot about mountain lions and their large home ranges and why connectivity and fragmentation is really important for mountain lions because of the, their large home ranges. American badger may not be as large of an animal, but they also have home ranges that can measure up to at least several square kilometers, if not more. So badgers really need to be able to move large distances and connect from one patch of habitat or grassland to the next in order to find their food, to find mates, or to find new territories as they grow into adulthood. So that regional connectivity is very important for their health and their survival, especially in open and grassland habitats. Researchers have also found strong correlations between where badgers are on the landscape and the density of their prey, meaning that they sort of follow their food. So we might expect to find badgers in a part of a preserve where there are a lot of ground squirrels or pocket gophers, for example. And if you are interested in learning more about mountain lions, uh, Midpen did host a mountain lion talk uh, with one of my colleagues, Matt Sharp Cheney, and I think we can provide a link to that talk um, somewhere in one of our comment chats here. On the landscape scale, badgers are usually associated with grasslands or open areas within other habitat types. We believe this is true in the peninsula also, but again, um, data here, especially in our preserves, are a little bit lacking. Badgers play an important role in the grassland ecosystem, and unfortunately, today, native grasslands are among the most endangered ecosystems in the United States, and even more so in California. Roughly 10% of the district's 65,000 protected acres is characterized as grassland dominant habitat that many species, including badgers, rely on. So I'm very grateful for Midpen's mission and commitment to acquire these natural open spaces and protect them from being developed. This also creates an inherent overlap with areas that are used as rangelands for cattle or other livestock and with grazing management regi regimes because badger, it, badgers and those regimes use the same type of habitat, these sort of open grassy areas. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on in the talk. Burrowing owls, burrowing or fossorial animals create a rich network of activity in their habitats and uh, as you can see in this illustration, that's a little bit fuzzy, I apologize, um, from Bay Nature, we can see how animals like California ground squirrels, burrowing owls, badgers, weasels, gopher snakes, even larger mammals like coyotes, they all sort of influence each other with their activity on this very active burrowing landscape. Badgers have important ecological roles in these landscapes as bioturbators, or sometimes described as ecosystem engineers, because because of all of that digging activity that they do, they rework and aerate the soils, they mix sediments and organic matter, they move around seed banks. All of this movement facilitates water flow and nutrient cycling. So badgers are a really important link in the overall health um, of this ecosystem. Badgers also play an important role for balancing ecosystems by controlling rodent populations. Um, again, their main source of food those rodent populations eat organic matter or plants. So if those rodent populations are not controlled or kept in check by animals like badgers, that could put excessive strain on the native plant communities. So again, badgers are an important link for many reasons um, for the health of their ecosystems. 
Badger burrows are very characteristic. Um, so if you're ever walking on, on a trail or a landscape and you see a dig or a burrow and you're wondering what it is, maybe some of this information can help you. The burrow entrance is wider than it is tall and it's usually about seven or 10 inches across. And sometimes you can see unique claw marks that move horizontally along the side of the burrow because when badgers dig, they tend to dig with uh, sort of a breaststroke action, like scooping the soil um, horizontally toward and away from themselves, rather than digging downward the way that something like a coyote would dig. So sometimes you can see marks from their very long claws horizontally moving um, on the walls of that burrow. The most characteristic sign of a badger burrow is the large mound of soil that is piled up right at the entrance of that hole. And that, that mound of soil um, is often called a tailing or an apron. And that mound of soil can, can be up to one square meter in size. So this is a tremendous amount of dirt that this animal can move. And it, again, it just sort of leaves it piled up right at the entrance of that burrow. So if you see either of these things um, while you're walking or hiking through the grasslands, you very well could be looking at a badger burrow. While you're hiking, you may also come across a cluster of smaller holes, which are called diggings. And these are often mistaken for burrows, but they actually represent a, a different behavior and a, a different kind of pattern. So when badgers detect prey under the ground uh, with their strong senses of smell and hearing, they'll dig several smaller holes to try to get to that prey. And so these holes or diggings can be different in size and depth, but overall, um, sometimes they're, they're sort of clustered tightly together and you don't normally see that large mound of dirt associated with these smaller diggings. Badger burrows also provide habitat for many native and protected species, including snakes, salamanders like the one seen here in this photo, red foxes, and burrowing owls, which I'll touch on in a moment. Long-tailed weasels also use badger burrows for shelter or simply to explore out of curiosity. And we have uh, a fun video to share with you. So Mike, can you play the weasel video? Great, thank you. Um, that video does not have sound, but I love how charismatic they are. Um, that was taken by one of our uh, study wildlife cameras in our Montebello Preserve, and I'll describe uh, more about that process later. American badgers are solitary until their mating season, uh, when males will expand their already very large um, home ranges by up to two to three times in search of a female in order to find her and mate with her. Adults mate between late summer and early fall, and then something very interesting happens called delayed implantation or arrested development. And the fertilized egg, this is when the, the fertilized egg in the female stays suspended and does not develop until the following January or February, which is sometimes up to a six month delay, which is pretty incredible. This is very likely an adaptive response to seasonal changes in resource availability. So they will breed, they'll mate when, um, food resources are abundant and they're healthy physically, and then they'll sort of pause that development over the winter when those things are less so, and then begin that development uh, once food resources and their health are uh, much better in the following spring. Females will dig a special natal den with several openings and chambers where they give birth to anywhere from one to five young. Usually it's two individuals. Um, those young are called kits or cubs and they are born blind for the first several weeks of their lives after, um, after which the mother can then move them to different locations that are closer to sources of prey. Young are weaned after about eight weeks, at which time they can eat solid foods that are brought back to um, the den by the mother. Eventually they will join her on hunts and eventually um, at about three or four months of age, they eventually disperse to find their own territories, again, solitary on their own in their own territories. And I do wanna note that when young badgers disperse to seek their own territories, once they reach that um, adult age, they can be especially vulnerable um, because they may need to cross roads or cross dangerous terrain, and they are at risk of getting hit by vehicles during this time. 
Predator species like hawks and coyotes have been observed following badgers while they hunt as sort of um, an interesting hunting relationship between those species. And I suspect many of you have seen Peninsula Open Space Trust's video of a coyote and badger traveling through a culvert together. If you haven't seen it, it's absolutely incredible. I highly recommend that you do. You can find it on um, their website at openspacetrust.org. You can Google coyote badger video. Uh, I think we can provide a link for it in our comment uh, chat as well. Um, and it really shows a, a clear relationship between the coyote and badger. And this relationship has been seen by other researchers, particularly when they hunt. Um, badgers take advantage of the prey that's driven underground by the coyote and the coyote benefits from prey being chased above ground by the badger. So each partner sort of brings a different skill that the other one lacks and they both actually can um, hunt faster and better than they would um, independently. Um, so yeah, I think this video is just absolutely incredible and please check it out if you do have the opportunity. The badger's striking facial patterns and aggressive behavior help them fight off larger predators, even things like bears, mountain lions, and vehicles. And for all of these reasons, badgers have very few natural predators, although some of their predators include mountain lions and even groups of coyotes. I'm going to try to play an audio clip of a badger for you, so hopefully this will work out. So as you can hear from this clip, badgers can make a range of growling, grunting, and snarling vocalizations in order to communicate, especially when they're feeling territorial. Um, or protective of their burrows. It might be no surprise that humans present the greatest threat to the species. Badger habitat is developed and fragmented. Historically, they've been trapped heavily for their pelts and hunted as a pest species, sometimes falsely accused of being a risk to livestock or crop production. As far back as 1937, um, zoologist Joseph Grinnell and his colleagues wrote that the American badger was threatened with complete elimination by a quote, overzealous campaign to re remove all of the native animals from the range because they might prove unfriendly to some phase of agriculture. They're also very vulnerable to vehicle collision, as I mentioned before, um, when they move near roads because even uh, adults are short and difficult to see by drivers. And they are at risk of secondary poisoning when they eat rodents, their main source of food, um, that have been affected by rodenticides. And so the illustration on the left here shows sort of the sometimes inflammatory, aggressive behavior of badgers. The photo in the middle is of a, a pelt of an American badger. And the photo on the right is unfortunately of a badger that was um, struck and killed by a vehicle in Coyote Valley. The North American badger population has declined throughout its North American range due to habitat loss, fragmentation, misinformed trapping, and excessive poaching. As a result, it was listed as a species of special concern in 1986 by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. This listing is not only a legal protection, is not a legal protection, but it does encourage attention to and research of the species um, in order to pre prevent further decline. And another species that I've mentioned earlier, the burrowing owl, is also listed as a species of special concern. Burrowing owls are medium-sized owls found in open areas with low vegetation. And like badgers, they are also very dependent on grassland habitats. They live and breed in underground burrows, usually made by another species that they um, sort of take over the burrow and that other species is not using it anymore. And these include badger burrows. In the San Francisco Bay Area, they most commonly use California ground squirrel burrows, but we do, we have documented them using badger burrows at our Purse McCreek Redwoods Preserve, which is uh, what this photo shows. And for the same habitat loss and fragmentation reasons that badger experience, the burrowing owl is also at risk of population and genetic decline. To date, in our preserves, burrowing owls have only been seen during the winter um, and not breeding. So now that we've 
talked about some interesting badger and owl biology. I'm going to switch gears here to discuss uh, an interesting study that we're currently running. And some of this content may get a little bit technical, but I'll try not to get too far into the weeds. As biologists at MidPen, the problem that we sort of found ourselves trying to solve was, we know that badger and burrowing owl occur on the peninsula in our preserves, but we know very little beyond that. Things like their distribution, their population status, or even their population size, their genetic status in the Santa Cruz Mountains in our preserves, and also within our sphere of influence, so that area outlined in green on the map. Because badgers and owls are both species of special concern, because badgers in particular serve an important ecological role, and because our district's mission and policies are focused on conserving sensitive resources, we really wanted to know more um, about these species in order to inform our management decisions. And Kareem, sorry yeah. to interrupt, and just, just a sure. friendly reminder, we're, we're doing great on time, but we have about 15 minutes left for the main presentation, and thanks for everybody uh, submitting comments and uh, questions. Great, thank you for the time check. So as a result, um, because of that position that we found ourselves in, um, we started a study in 2019 to assess badger and burrowing owl habitat and their populations. The goals and objectives of this study were to assess the existing data, everything that's currently available um, at that point in our region regarding badger and burrowing owls then to use that data to create models and analyses that tell us um, what on the habitat, what features on the habitat we would expect to associate or where we, we would expect to find badgers and burrowing owls. And also to run analysis to tell us where the, the best pathways of movement are for badgers in particular. We also uh, are collecting more data to um, increase that data um, that amount of information that we have on both species and to plug that data into um, those other analyses of our study. And all of this in the end will help us create well-informed management plans for both species and their habitats. Badgers are the primary species of focus for the study. And because we know that burrowing owls use their burrows in our preserves, we included owls in our study as a sort of secondary component. So most of the results I'll be sharing with you today will be related to badgers. The study is managed and funded by MidPen, and it is performed by a team of consultant biologists and experts, um, folks with Pathways for Wildlife, San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, independent researchers Jesse Quinn and Ken Hickman, Ben Dax, Director of Mammalian Ecology and Conservation at UC Davis Genetics Lab, and Stuart Weiss, Founder and Chief Scientist of Creekside Center for Earth Observation. So we have a really stellar team of experts um, collecting a lot of great information and a big shout out to them. There are three major components to the study. The first is a habitat suitability assessment, which basically tells us the, the what's on the habitat or the landscape that badgers and owls are mostly using. So what habitat features are most associated with where we find badgers and owls? The second part of the study is a habitat linkage design, which tells us the pathways that are most important for badger movement specifically, or the sort of wares on the landscape that we should care about in terms of management. And the third component of the study is um, doing additional field surveys to collect more information. And like I said before, that information on badger and owls in our preserves will be plugged back into those first two components to sort of strengthen that uh, analysis um, and strengthen, strengthen the assessment there. We started the study process by pulling all of that existing regional badger, badger and owl data together. Um, this information came from other folks' research um, projects in the area, um, public platforms like iNaturalist and eBird. We pulled all that information together, reviewed it, and used it in the first study component. And results from that first part of the study told us that Badger, existing badger observations are most influenced by grassland habitats and fine sandy soils. So these results are not surprising. It basically tells us that badgers, you know, are found in grassland habitats where they can easily dig in the soil. Again, they're not surprising results, but it's a good initial confirmation that badgers in our preserves are present where we expect to find them. 
We will also be looking very carefully at areas where we don't expect to find them to make sure that our assumptions are still correct. And the, the pink dots on this map here represent those um, historic badger observations from all that data that we pulled together. Results from the second part of the study, the linkage design, gave us a very compelling glimpse into what life might be like for badgers on the peninsula. This analysis basically measures how easy it is for a badger to move through the landscape based on different habitat features that are present. Things like open grasslands that are easy for them to move through, developed areas that are not easy at all to move through, steep ravines that are difficult to move through, etc. So what we found were three major pathways or linkages, a central linkage um, that's shown in this circled area here, sort of midway through the peninsula, and our Lahonda Open Space Preserve sort of sits right in the middle of that linkage. A coastal linkage that runs pretty much along Highway 1, and an eastern linkage that extends further east. Now, imagine yourself as a badger with a large home range. You have an essential need to move through your habitat in order to find food and to breed. You need to be able to get from one prime patch to another. And these pathways or linkages shown on the map in yellow and orange are like arteries that facilitate this movement. And unfortunately, they're quite narrow at this point because so much of the peninsula has been altered or developed in some way and is now difficult for badgers to move through. So as managers, this is a very powerful image to identify geographic areas that are important to protect, maintain, or enhance in some way to help that badger connectivity stay flowing. The central linkage, that area, that first area that was circled in the middle of the map, um, can be broken into different, several smaller specific connections. And I just wanted to show you one. This map shows the path or the linkage running through best badger habitat that's available between our La Honda Creek Preserve, which is on the left, and uh, the, our Montebello Preserve, which is the dark blue area on the right. And I wanted to show this linkage because it runs through four different parcels of land that have not been developed and are, are maintained as relatively natural landscapes. And this really attests to the importance of protecting against that development and fragmentation. If, the, if these areas and parcels did not exist, this linkage would likely be very uh, much more difficult for badgers to cross through. We also discovered using this analysis and maps like these that there's a possible bottleneck into Montebello from the adjacent grassland because it's lined by trees or other habitat, um, sort of more forested habitat that's difficult for badger to move through. So these are things that we as managers can try to improve or enhance in some way, um, keeping badgers in mind. Our study's coastal linkage is especially intriguing because of how narrowly it passes through several non-midpen parcels. You can see how this could be the only feasible path for badgers to reach the central and eastern areas moving along the coast, moving northward to reach that central area and hop over to the east. You can also see how this is important to facilitate physical and genetic flow for this population. So if this corridor were blocked at any point, that physical and genetic flow could also be blocked altogether. Badgers would also be at further risk of crossing dangerous terrain or busy roadways like Highway 1 in order to reach their habitats, again, putting them at further risk of vehicle strike and, um, and being killed by vehicles. So at this point, halfway through our study, we see how essential this linkage is for badger, badgers. We know they're reliant on grasslands, many of which fall in these coastal great grazing and rangeland areas. So this is sort of my call for participation and collaboration with other regional landowners, especially along the coastal corridor that we see here. Our study team and MidPen are in active communication with folks like Tomcat Ranch and Point Blue Conservation Science to coordinate badger and grazing management efforts because again, they sort of fall on the same kind of landscape and in the same geographic distribution. And in the long run, we want to form a network of regional partners and collaborators who are invested in badger protection, monitoring on their own lands, sharing those data, and informing regional management of the species. So if you are interested in participating in the study, please get in touch with us. And if you're interested in a regional collaboration toward badgered stewardship, 
please get in touch with us. I really encourage you to do so. The third component of our study is actively ongoing. This is that um, collecting further data um, through a variety of means. So transects um, to search for badger and owl sign are surveyed during three seasons of the year, fall, winter, and spring. We've just completed our first year of, of surveys. Um, the lines on the map on the right show um, all of those colored lines are the different transects that have already been surveyed so far. Uh, there are six rounds of surveys, so three of those six surveys have, have been completed and will complete the next year and will be complete in 2021. The photos on the left show just sort of what a transect survey might look like. So our researchers walk these transects and anytime they find sign of badger or owl, they will stop and collect um, a variety of pieces of information or metrics, um, as you can see in the photo on the bottom left. During these surveys, wildlife cameras are also used um, to document badger and owl movement. We also collect hair and fecal samples in order to do um, some genetic analysis to understand our badger populations a little bit better and quite possibly understand if our badgers are genetically different than others found in different areas. The photo on the left shows what's called a hair snare, which is kind of like a comb that is attached to a badger burrow. And when a badger moves in and out of the burrow, their backs or their bodies sort of brush up gently against that snare and um, individual hairs are caught and collected on that snare. So researchers can then go back and collect those individual hairs and use them for genetic processing. So it's a very passive way of collecting samples in order to do some genetic analysis. Our team is also able to collect samples from other researchers or other badgers. If there's a report of a badger that was killed on a roadway, um, we can coordinate some sample collection there. So if you hear of anything or if you know of uh, any opportunities for us to um, collect, please do get in touch with us. We're very interested in that information as well. We just finished our spring surveys and we're learning a lot about badger activities in our preserves. Um, badger presence has been confirmed at 68% of the transect surveyed so far, which is very exciting. So that's a lot of really great information that we can then plug back into those other analyses. Badgers were found to be in several of our district preserves, including Parisima Creek, Redwoods, La Honda Creek, Montebello, Windy Hill, Tunitas Creek, and our Russian Ridge preserves, like this photo seen here. This is a, uh, a badger caught on one of our wildlife cameras um, in the, our Russian Ridge preserve on a wildlife trail that is near the Rapley Ranch Road. And this photo was taken by another one of our wildlife cameras in our Windy Hill Preserve. And I also wanted to share with you a video that our fantastic study team members from Pathways for Wildlife put together to highlight our latest footage from this camera. So Mike, can you go ahead and play the 2020 video? Thank you, Mike. My favorite part of that video is the badger, of course, walking down the trail. And I also think it's very interesting to see the mountain lion take a moment to smell and nudge the camera. Um, it's really interesting to see wildlife interact with our, our monitoring methods. Um, 
wildlife cameras like this really help us confirm um, and verify whether or not badgers are moving through those predicted pathways or those linkages. So Windy Hill is proving to be a very active area for a lot of different species, including badgers. Um, I hope you enjoyed that brand new footage fresh from our recent surveys. We have been able to collect some really great information during our first year of study, and we look forward to what we find during year two. Even though our fantastic study team has searched in many of our preserves, zero burrowing owls have been detected during surveys, which is not entirely surprising because we've only ever um, confirmed them present during the winter. But one burrowing owl was captured on wildlife camera footage at the Cloverdale property in December in 2019, which is the photo that you see here. Um, burrowing owl presence seems to be a little bit limited um, by low availability of suitable habitats in our area, but we will continue looking for their presence and how that might correlate with badger, um, badger presence and their burrows. As we move into year two of our field studies, we're going to focus on our southern preserves, um, places in Sierra Azul and El Monte. And like I said before, at this point, we're ready to begin building a regional coalition of partners and managers so folks who are also invested in protecting badgers and burrowing owls, folks who work in rangelands and grazing, since there is that inherent overlap of habitats, and folks especially along the coast. So if you are interested and you have means to participate in our study, we would really love to hear from you. There are a couple more ways that you can contribute to our study as individuals. You can sign up as a volunteer to join um, a survey with one of our, with our team of researchers. Opportunities for volunteering are limited, but we'll try to fit you in if possible. We also want your observations. If you see uh, badgers or owls while you're out hiking around um, or you see their sign, please send us that information or upload it to iNaturalist because we are using those data sources as well in our analysis so that we can include it um, in our data set and in our analysis. You can contact me um, at any time. Uh, mine is the, the first email up here. Again, my name is Corrine, and that's my email address. You can also contact Tanya Diamond um, with Pathways for Wildlife. She's sort of our, our main point of contact from our consultant team. So e her email is there in the middle. Or if you have any general questions, you can always contact us at MidPen at our general um, contact link at info at openspace.org. And I, I always encourage folks to stay engaged as stewards of the species and their habitats. So I also want to take a moment to thank our wonderful team of researchers, Pathways for Wildlife, who are Tanya Diamond and Ahiga Snyder, with SFBBO, San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, Dan Wenny and Ewa Wong, independent badger expert and PhD, Jesse Quinn, independent researcher, Ken Hickman, and again, Ben Sachs, um, Director of Mammalian Ecology and Conservation Unit at UC Davis Genetics Lab, and Stuart Weiss, Founder and Chief Scientist of Creekside Center for Earth Science, Earth Observation. So I'm representing the team today, but I really look forward to future opportunities when they can share all of our study findings with you once the study is complete. So again, a huge thanks to all of you for doing all of the hard work out there. MidPen is committed to protecting regional American badger and burrowing owl populations by preserving their habitat, increasing connectivity, especially in areas where their movement corridors have become so narrow, like we saw in those maps. We're committed to supporting research that improves our understanding so that we can make um, the best management decisions on the landscape for the species and their habitats. I can't say enough how much I enjoy these truly charismatic species and animals that we share our open spaces with. So thank you for your interest in badgers and for joining our virtual talk today. Um, at this point, I'm, I'll hand it back over to Mike for a few of your questions. Okay. Thank you, Kareem, for the excellent presentation. And I personally really loved hearing that uh, badger growl. <laughs> And uh, we have been getting a lot of questions coming in and have time definitely to answer a few. We've got about 10 minutes here and see, and we'll definitely be looking through all these comments and, and questions um, if we, even if we don't get to yours now. Um, first, have you personally seen a badger? I have not personally seen a badger. Um, it's sort of my my goal to not leave the Bay Area for any reason until I do. <laughs> a lot of, even people who, even researchers who, who work with badgers say that they're very um, 
difficult to see. It's, it's quite rare to actually see an animal. 95% of the time you will see their sign on the landscape. So those burrows or diggings uh, rather than seeing the actual animal. But if you do, um, congratulations, that's, a, that's quite an observation. Okay, great. And do badgers live alone or with other badgers? Badgers are mostly solitary. Um, they do come together during those times of, of mating in the late summer, early fall, and females will stay with her, um, with her young for a few months. But for the most part, they are solitary animals that um, just are, are by themselves on the landscape. Great. And how many badgers do you think there are in the Santa Cruz Mountains? That's a very good question. And Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do the study that we're doing. Um, we can't accurately say, uh, and I can't comfortably say how many we think there are, uh, how large the population is in the Santa Cruz Mountains, specifically in our preserves. In some nearby areas, uh, researchers have found that um, badger densities can be somewhere in the area of one badger per four square kilometers. but Again, it would be difficult to, to make the assumption that that is also true here. So we really look forward to the results of our study and hopefully we can understand not only population size, but also distribution in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Excellent. And we did have the question of, will we be publishing the study results? That is uh, one of our hopes to do so. Yeah, absolutely. We will be certainly sharing our study results with um, not only you know, internally with district staff, but with other regional land managers and collaborators. Um, we, we do hope to pursue um, publishing in a, a scientific journal, um, publishing our results so that those are available for others as well. Okay, and a very important question here. Someone was asking if I'm gonna badger you with questions. <laughs> I hope not, but today is the day of badgers. <laughs> I, I hope not too. Um, how, how long, here's a real question, how long do badgers typically live in the wild? Uh, I think the, the most accurate that we can say is badger lifespan is typically four to five years in, uh, in the wild. Um, they can live and they've been reported to live for much longer in captivity, which is true for pretty much any wildlife species. Um, again, because badgers are difficult to monitor and study that information could change with, with different um, research results, but uh, what's published currently in the literature is about four to five years. Okay, great. And so what should I do if I see a badger and should I be afraid of badgers? That's a great question. Um, I would say if you see a badger and if you, you are observing that badger from a safe distance for, for both your safety and the badger's safety, I would say the first thing you should do is enjoy your observation because again, they're kind of rare to, to come across. Badgers can be aggressive, um, especially if they feel threatened or if um, you, know, you come across a burrow and there's a badger actually in the burrow. So in those situations, I would say absolutely make sure that you're giving yourself enough space um, to, to make sure that you're keeping yourself safe and the badger safe. Uh, enjoy your observation. Um, you don't necessarily need to be afraid of them as long as, again, you're keeping that safe distance. And I would highly encourage you to report your observation to um, a platform like iNaturalist, or you can email myself or Tanya so that we can um, keep collecting that really great information. I would say if you come across a burrow and you think it's a badger burrow, don't put anything in the burrow, like don't reach your hand in or, or even a stick or something to explore what's down there. Just sort of, you know, Passively observe, uh, appreciate, and move on. No badgering badgers. Exactly. <laughs> and so we saw uh, the badgers and coyote, badger and coyote together. Um, do they typically get along or do we know that? And are there other relationships that we know like this in the wild, or in this area perhaps? Yeah, uh, I would say from the reports that I've read from other researchers when they find badgers and coyotes together, I wouldn't say that's a you know very common thing that's seen, but it is seen um, in some cases. They seem to have a mutualistic relationship. Um, they do seem to get along just fine. There isn't any aggression displayed by one or the other. So it seems to be sort of a, a mutualistic a sort of agreement or relationship there. Especially in the video, you can see that positive 
you, you can infer sort of a positive relationship there. There are other examples of mutualistic relationships um, in the wild. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, grazing species and um, especially in very hot or arid environments and the birds that sort of hang out with those species and pick off pests or flies or just sort of um, use that, that resource as their own source of prey as well. And that seems to benefit both of those species. Great. And are they, and you mentioned some of the, the relationship, are they related to raccoons and possums? No, they're not technically related to raccoons. They are mammals. They are um, uh, carnivorous mammals, but they're in different um, families. So they, they sort of look similar, but they're not technically or genetically related. Um, they're somewhat found in, in similar natural landscapes, but even that um, raccoons and, and opossums are I would say much more um, opportunistic and well adapted to developed areas, and whereas badgers are absolutely not. I would say very, very less so. Okay. And someone's asking just about your background, if you'd mind telling telling us a little bit about your training. Oh, my personal background. Um, yeah, where your, your scientist, your biologist background, sure. and how you how you came to Mid Pen, perhaps. Yeah, sure. I'm a, a wildlife biologist. I've been working in this field for, I, I don't know, probably 12 years now. Um, my background is mostly with birds and small mammals. And I came to MidPen about three years ago. Uh, I And I work in our uh, on our wildlife team and our natural resources department. So uh, between the three of us, uh, my two other colleagues and I, we do sort of all things wildlife with the district. So we cover um, mammal uh, management and research, bird management and research, and also um, very heavily involved in herpetological studies like red-legged frogs and um, San Francisco garter snake, for example. What's a, a general term for herpetological? Uh, amphibians and reptiles. Uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay, audience. No, it's good. I'm learning a lot today. Sure. Um, we have time for, we'll do a just a few few more questions. Uh, this is great. There's so many coming in. Sure. Um, do do we, do you know if they eat snakes? Um, yes, I have. I have read that badgers do eat snakes, sort of opportunistically. Um, again, their primary source of food are burrowing rodents, but they they sort of eat whatever they come across and whatever they can find. Okay. And related to that, since burrowing owls sometimes use their burrows. Have there has there been evidence of conflict or surprises, perhaps? Oh, between the owls and the badgers? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not sure. I, I would imagine that has probably happened at one point or another. <laughs> I would say in that situation, the, the badger would most likely win the the, the fight. Um, but yeah, typically burrowing owls come upon burrows um, that other animals have made when they're no longer in use or they've been abandoned. So um, yeah, I'm not sure, but I, I would suspect maybe. Okay. Yeah, that makes makes some sense. And uh, it's maybe the last last question. And I know we may not know. And there's you know, with these fires going on, um, there's a question like there's been a few different questions, but like how are fires affecting badgers? And someone talked about they can go underground. Um, obviously, we're not going to know about. Excuse me about what these uh, current fire situation, but it, which will be, there'll be a significant evaluation, but I don't know if you have any general thoughts or understanding uh, about that. Yeah, I, I would say because their primary habitat are these open grasslands that are, um, you know, very susceptible to fire impacts. I do suspect that our badger populations are sort of being forced to move around um, in those areas at this point. And if, if those fires do move into um, some of our open grassy areas in our preserves, I would suspect a, a pretty strong impact there. So that's something that um, I think we're going to have to incorporate in our study and I think would be a good idea. Um, I, I don't know specifically how badgers might be able to avoid fire impacts by burrowing and sort of waiting for the fire to pass, I would suspect that is not um, a method that would be successful. I would suspect that badgers are, are physically moving through the landscape to get away from, from the immediate threat. Okay. All right. Thanks. 
So we're going to uh, wrap up here. That is all the time we do have for questions. Uh, but thank you so much, Kareen, for the wonderful presentation. Learned so much. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, you can learn more about Badgers on our website. See the URL on the screen and send questions. You've seen the email before. And please join us on your social media platform or platforms of choice. And uh, you can also sign up for our monthly e-news at the bottom of any of our web pages. So we wish you a great and safe rest of your day. And thanks again. Thank you, Corrine. And uh, we'll see you later. Goodbye. Thank you all.